Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll hear a musical performance from the Friends of Al Siegley Band. But first, joining me now is Dr. Eric Buren, the author of Protesting on Bended Knee, Race, Descent, and Patriotism in the 21st Century America. Dr. Buren, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, it's an honor. As we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background. Well, as you kindly noted, I am a professor of history at the University of North Dakota. Uh, I've been teaching there since 1999. The courses span from the Revolutionary Era through the post-Civil War period, as well as African American history. My wife is also a historian. Uh, we have two wonderful children, and what I'm told are just three cats, but at times seems like hundreds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I understand you wrote the introduction uh, to this book, which also also features essays from other f uh, f folks uh, on sports and protests. Uh, but give us an overview of what the book is about. Yeah, the book has two sections. The first is an extended introduction by myself uh, that tries to place the Kaepernick protests against injustice within the broad sweep of American history. So I'm narrating as best I can the different perspectives of different individuals, all while contextualizing against the American past. The second portion of the book consists of about 30 essays that look at the protests from various perspectives. So for example, the first essay sort of, again, contextualizes the protest. Uh, against the backdrop of American history. There's a section concerning the law. Uh, what can the government compel people to do? What can the government not uh, allow people to do? What uh, rights do employers have in regard to what their employees can and cannot say? A third section is about athletes as uh, activists. They have a very unique perspective, whether they're black or female or are professional or an amateur. A fourth section concerns protest tactics. Uh, there's a million different ways that individuals who advocate for change uh, can, can actually adopt their tactics. A fifth section concerns counter tactics, that is to say, what do the opponents of change, what can they do to stop the advocates of change? And finally, there's a sixth section called Others in the Arena that looks at the Kaepernick protests from a variety of perspectives, coaches, veterans, sports journals, those sorts of things. Yeah. Well, you released the book on the 50th anniversary of the famous Tommy Smith, uh, John Carlos fist raising at the Mexico City uh, Olympics in 1968. It, it, can you tell us, did you do that obviously on purpose and re made me remind people what that event was all about? Right, uh, 1968, John Carlos and Tommy Smith uh, famously raised their fists during the national anthem during the Mexico City Olympics to protest a variety of things, but in general, racial injustice, poverty, these sorts of things. Of course, they suffered a price for their, their protests and uh, were deemed you know, unpatriotic or ungrateful or divisive. Um, and so it just happened to be the 50th anniversary uh, when we released this book. And again, there are obviously uh, uh, ways in which the, the, the Smith protests and the Mexico City protests resonate with the Kaepernick protests. In fact, if you look on the back of the book, you can see that we did a logo uh, that has the Kaepernick famous and then, of course, uh, the Tommy Smith uh, with, and John Carlos fist raised. Yeah, sure. Can you, can you then talk about uh, Colin Kaepernick's situation and how you approached it in the book? Right. So again, as the editor uh, of the introduction, I tried to set it against the broad sweep uh, of American history. But then again, one of the things that's so interesting about the Kaepernick protests is that they resonate with people in so many different ways. So some people see it through the lens of race. Other people see it through the lens of dissent. Other people see it through the lens of protest. And so that uh, made me think that this is a, a book that would resonate with a lot of people. So again, you know, one of the sections uh, is on, you know, protest tactics. Kaepernick is historically informed. He, uh, he adopted a tactic that others had used in the past, uh, whether it's protesting silently or taking a knee. Uh, but then again, those who oppose him are also adopting historically informed counter tactics, whether it be uh, saying they're ungrateful or divisive or uh, that they, in some instances, should find another country. Hmm. So why are there so many differing views on uh, Kaepernick? Well, I think, again, it is protest resonates in, in lots of different ways. Uh, 
and that, that speaks to, to how important the things are he's saying. So on one hand, he's protesting racial injustice. So that takes up an important part in the introduction. I talk a lot about uh, the political context in which he protested, the rise of mass incarceration, those sorts of things. But at the same time, uh, people see it through the lens of First Amendment issues, uh, which is pretty interesting because it gets into the questions of, you know, what rights do uh, employers have in terms of suppressing the expressions of their uh, employees or conversely, what rights do employees have in terms of being able to express themselves? So it resonates with so many people in so many different ways, and I think that's one of the virtues of studying it in depth uh, the way we have done here. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's been blackballed by the NFL? That's a great question. Uh, so, of course, Kaepernick has filed a collusion suit against the NFL, uh, basically claiming that the NFL and one or more teams or two or more teams conspired to keep him out of the league. What's particularly interesting about Kaepernick's situation is that he started protesting during a period when we have uh, much more robust ways of analyzing players' uh, productivity. So in the oldie days, we might say like, well, you know, his team went two and 14 or his team went, you know, four and 10 or something like that. And we would be able to say like, well, he's not very good. Now we have very robust metrics for measuring how good athletes are. Nobody who studies this seriously believes that he is not an NFL quality quarterback. That being said, teams don't have to sign him just because he's a good quarterback. They could say, we're not going to take him simply because we don't want to deal with the hassle that, that would come with it. One of the interesting aspects about that collusion case, though, is that it could result in a major constitutional crisis. So it's clear that the NFL owners were terrified of President Trump. Uh, they were worried that he would send out, as he described it, a mean tweet. Um, and NFL owners were in dialogue with Trump. So Kaepernick's lawyers want to, at some point, subpoena Trump or Vice President Pence uh, because they want to know what he said to those owners and what the owners said to him. Um, it, Trump can't be a party to the collusion suit. That's simply between the NFL and the teams and Kaepernick. But if a U.S. district court subpoenas Trump to testify in this case, the question becomes, will Trump submit? Will he actually, you know, testify or will he invoke some sort of executive privilege? This could set up a showdown between the powers of the judicial branch and the executive branch. So thus, one man taking a knee could lead to a major constitutional crisis. Hmm. Do you think that Kaepernick will ever play football in the NFL again? Hmm. Um, that's difficult to say. Uh, I think most people who opine on the matter say probably not. But I still think there's, there's uh, possibilities there. One of the things that's interesting to recall is that Kaepernick, though very divisive in many respects, is far more popular in our day than, say, Martin Luther King Jr. was in his day. So the fact that Nike could sign him suggests that he has a resonance with at least certain segments of the population that might convince some NFL owners to maybe take a chance. But uh, again, most people who opine on the matter say probably not. Yeah. So maybe you've already explained this just with Kaepernick here, but how dangerous can it be for athletes to speak out on issues? I mean, famously, O.J. Simpson never did, but yet others like Jim Brown, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and Muhammad Ali did. Uh, it varies a lot. It varies uh, if they're an amateur. So, for example, uh, high school athletes or university athletes, they have virtually no legal safeguards. If they do something that the university or the coach uh, thinks is you know, bringing their team into disrepute, they're gone. Uh, it matters if they're professional. Again, sometimes they have more legal safeguards than others. It matters if they're African American. It matters if they're women. Uh, there's a lot of variability uh, that goes into what one can do and when one can do it. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference in 21st century uh, protests versus past decades? Yeah, well, in many ways, they're similar. And that's one of the points of the book that, you know, again, Kaepernick can be set against the large historical backdrop. But one of the other ways in which, you know, 21st century protests are different is communication and revolutions. So, for example, Kaepernick and other uh, athlete activists were able to use Twitter to communicate their messages in ways that weren't possible, uh, say, a generation or two ago. 
What's also interesting about this, though, is that they're not the first activists to take advantage of these communication revolutions. So, for example, uh, anti-slavery activists before the Civil War took advantage of the steam-powered press. Uh, this was a revolutionary device that allowed them to print broadsides uh, and, and distribute their message in new and, and inexpensive ways. Uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, they took advantage of uh, the proliferation of television. And so, you know, people who otherwise had no interest in what was going on in the South, you know, saw for the first time, you know, what segregation uh, looked like. And so, in some ways, Twitter is different because it allows athletes to, to build communities of support and get their message out in their own way. But in other ways, this also harkens back to things we've seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, who are some of the really brave athletes, in your opinion, in history? Well, obviously, Muhammad Ali is probably one of the first and foremost ones. You know, he lost uh, you know, some of the, the, the greatest years of his life you know, because he refused to be inducted into the uh, military for, uh, to fight in Vietnam. What's also interesting about those sorts of figures, though, is they tend to get um, divested of their radicalism over time. So you know, now, a days, Muhammad Ali, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, we all see them as, as you know, kind and good figures who stood up and did the great fight. And what this allows us to do is to think that the opposition that they face or the causes for which they fought, those are in the past. We don't have to worry about those things. They, they were the sacrificial lambs of the time. What I think Kaepernick did is broke that little self-congratulatory reverie that you know, we can't just think of these things as being in the past. So what might happen down the road, we don't know. I'm a historian. I'm accustomed to thinking about the past as opposed to, to contemplating the future. What might happen is that Kaepernick's popularity, much like Martin Luther King Jr. or Frederick Douglass or Rosa Parks or Muhammad Ali, Kaepernick's popularity will increase over time. but he will also be divested of his radicalism. He'll be effaced from uh, the things that he actually was fought for. He'll be repackaged in such a way that will make future generations more comfortable with him. Hmm. Well, can you tell us about some of the other essays in the book? Sure, absolutely. So uh, again, some of my, my favorite essays concerned the tactics and counter tactics that, that uh, individuals use when trying to advocate or oppose change. So one of the few essays that I reached out to a specific person to um, write a specific essay concerned a African-American uh, from the 1700s, the late 1700s. His name was Richard Allen, and he was a devout Christian. He belonged to a biracial church, and uh, the white members of his church uh, segregated uh, the edifice. It basically said that the black members of the church had to go sit in uh, you know, different pews. And, and Allen you know, thought this was outrageous, this was unchristian, and so he went into the white section of his church and, and took a knee. He prayed. Uh, and he wanted to see what, what they would do, uh, not only what the church leaders would do, but also what the other, the other white parishioners would do. You know, in many ways, Allen was the original kneeler. Well, uh, his white co-religionists manhandled him, threw him out of the church. Allen never went back, and he formed the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is arguably one of the most important uh, institutions in, in black history. So there's essays like that. There's also essays, again, about the counter tactics. So one of the uh, important ones in my mind is this notion that one of the counter tactics that, that folks can use is this idea of demanding that protesters identify their end game. What is their ultimate goal? This is ingenious because on one hand, sometimes people engage in protests and they're not entirely sure you know, about what they're up against. It's also ingenious because there's this uh, sense that once that end point is achieved, all bets are off. We've reached a stasis. But that's not true in America, right? All victories are temporary. All losses are temporary, too. There is no end game. But when counter protests or counter people who adopt counter tactics say, what is your ultimate goal? It pigeonholes people into thinking that they must know everything what they're up against and also that there's going to be an end point. Hmm. Can, can you talk about some of the other writers who, who wrote the, some of these essays? Sure. Um, they come from all sorts of backgrounds. Uh, I'm particularly proud of the fact that North Dakotans took a, a lead in writing an important book on a subject of, of national significance. 
Uh, so when when I first decided that I was going to do this project, uh, I reached around really in uh, locally uh, and and around North Dakota for people I knew that would have interesting perspectives uh, on these matters. So there's a point of pride in saying that North Dakotans have, have a significant say in what uh, has happened. That being said, I also reached out and, and started exploring more uh, views nationwide. Uh, so there's people whose specialties are in communication. There's people whose specialties are in law. There's, uh, again, you know, veterans. There's coaches. There's former athletes. There's political scientists. There's philosophers. You know, for those who want a book that simply is Kaepernick a hero or is Kaepernick a villain, this probably isn't the book for them. Uh, there's a lot of subtlety and nuance. And so what I think we've produced is you know, the most comprehensive treatment of the subject to date that provides a panoramic view uh, of the Kaepernick protests against injustice. So how long did it take you to reach out to these folks and compile all this? Uh, I did a similar project on the Electoral College in the aftermath of the 2016 election. That project from idea to publication took five weeks, uh, which is extraordinarily rapid for, uh, you know, by publishing standards. I thought we might have something similar here, but as it turns out, of course, the story became much larger than I had originally envisioned. So from start to finish, it took about a year, but still by you know, publishing standards, that's extraordinarily quick. Uh, again, in the dedication uh, to my two beloved children, uh, I say this is the first draft of history, and it's uh, kind of a point of pride to be able to say that. Mm. So what kind of dialogue do you hope this book will spark? Yeah, again, for those who are looking for real black and white analyses, this probably isn't the book for them. But this book uh, actually is, is designed to spark, you know, civil dialogue in all sorts of places. You know, when I've done other interviews, I've been pleasantly surprised that folks who might, you know, one would think take umbrage at the book actually have been pretty open-minded about it, especially if they've actually thumbed through it. Uh, so I think it, it helps out in you know, classrooms, whether at the high school level or college level, or if you're doing something in a, in a public function like at a library or online. It's been able to, to again, sort of broaden the dialogue about you know, Kaepernick and, the, and his protests and, again, the, the causes for which he's protesting. Okay, with that, could you read a passage from the book? I'd be honored to do so. Thank you. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything, urges an advertisement featuring Colin Kaepernick. The passage is inscribed across an undoctored black and white close-up of Kaepernick's face, a nine-word label affixed right below his eyes, which stare directly and forever forward. The ad is for Nike, the corporate colossus that generates two and a half times as much revenue for the, as the National Football League, and it was unveiled to hyperbolic praise and condemnation in early September 2018, just as this volume was going to press. That a marketing campaign showcasing Kaepernick could royal emotions and dominate headlines testifies to the electrifying nature of his historic crusade against inequality generally and police brutality particularly. Kaepernick began protesting these matters on the field of play in August 2016 when he was a San Francisco 49ers quarterback, doing so initially by sitting and later by kneeling during the national anthem. Others followed suit. These gestures incited a national fur, and several of this volume's essays were originally published during that tumultuous period. A little over a year later, in September 2017, Kaepernick was out of the NFL, a free agent unable to secure employment despite the fact that many of the league's 32 teams needed a good quarterback and that Kaepernick's statistics indicated that he merited a shot. But Kaepernick remained sidelined, and only about a dozen NFL players were still demonstrating during the anthem. Then, President Donald Trump, while attending a rally in Alabama, addressed the issue using derogatory language, exhorting team owners to fire protesters and encouraging fans to quit watching games if they witnessed a demonstration. Trump's harangue landed like a lit match in a tinderbox, and amid the ensuing conflagration were written most of this essay's volumes, or this, uh, this volume's essays. Collectively, they provide a panoramic view of them. Most importantly, 
they show, as, this introduction, as does the introduction, that this tale, with its vast cast and varied scenes, with its naughty conundrums that cannot be undone perhaps by any means, was but the latest chapter in a still grander saga, that of black Americans' fight for freedom, an epic struggle that has necessitated many sacrificing some and some sacrificing everything. So do you think the anthem talk has calmed down uh, now in the NFL? Has the me media moved on to other things or is something else in play? Right. Well, there are still a handful of individuals uh, protesting during the national anthem, but you're right. Uh, it hasn't you know, had the, the resonance that it previously has. But that's not to say that it won't at some point. One of the interesting elements in the story is President Trump's off and on again attitudes towards it. When Kaepernick first part started protesting, Trump you know, said famously that maybe he should find another country. But later on, uh, when being interviewed by Bill O'Reilly, uh, O'Reilly said, you know, if you were a team owner, would you, uh, would you fire a protesting player? And Trump said, you know, uh, I, I think he's just trying to make a point. I just believe he's, he's not doing it in the right way. And O'Reilly said, you know, it's not really like you to, to pull your punches. Uh, and Trump said, you know, we've uh, not, not so many headlines right now. We'll, we'll deal with that at another time. And so at the time when Trump was running for president, he had a slightly different attitude than he does now. Subsequently, as I mentioned in the introduction, he turned it into his personal political pinata. He hasn't hit on that lately, but that's not to say he won't do so in the future. So you talked about civil discourse conversation, but what do you want people to take away from this book? Well, I'd like them most importantly to see that it a, has a panoramic view, that again, there's lots and lots of different ways to perceive this, whether it's through the prism of law, whether it's communications, philosophy, political science, but also to set Kaepernick against the broad sweep of American history. You know, one of the things that, that's you know, true is that when one looks back over the American past, one would be hard pressed to identify any instance of black protest that most white Americans uh, supported at the time. You know, again, as I mentioned earlier, Martin Luther King Jr. was far less popular in his day than Kaepernick is in ours. So again, to perceive this against the backdrop of American history, as well as to have a panoramic view of it, would be my ultimate goal for this project. Okay, so we're out of time. So if people want to read your book, where can they go? They can download the book for free. It's an open access book at thedigitalpress.org. Dr. Buren, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for more. The Friends of Al Siegley Band is a group of friends who enjoy a long history of performing their favorite tunes in the beautiful Minnesota Lake Country. Along with classic folk and gospel tunes, the Earhart Minnesota group experiments with original country tunes that anyone can dance to. There's a path I used to take that winds down by the lake where I wander as a lad each time I could. As a young boy there I found that real peace did abound. In this place where I live called Maplewood My thoughts still wander back to that old familiar shack In those maple-covered hills so far away Where I played there as a child My memories run wild And there is where I really want to stay How I love those maple hills of Minnesota in the maple-covered hills where I did grow It was there I learned to love That old blue sky up above Right there in my Minnesota home In my mind I still go back to that tumble down old shack where all my childhood memories remain. Those thoughts are still so strong and I know that I belong in those hills with all those maple trees again. As I go back there in thought, old memories are sought and I'm longing for the days that were so good. That's just when I wanna be, when I die, please.
bury me in those beautiful old hills of maple wood. How I love those maple hills of Minnesota, in those maple covered hills where I did roam. It was there I learned to love. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>